بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹ ہاؤ آر یو ٹوڈے آئی ہوپ یو آر فیلنگ گڈ آئی ہیو سم گڈ نیوز فار یو ٹوڈے ایکچولی دیٹ شوڈ میک یو ویری ہیپی اینڈ دا گڈ نیوز از دیٹ ٹوڈے وی ول اسٹارٹ دا فائنل سیگمنٹ آف آر انالیسز آف کنسمشن سو ٹوڈے وی ول ڈسکس ان ڈفرینٹ اسکرز اینڈ ان دا نیکسٹ لیکچر اینڈ دیٹ ول بی دا فائنل پارٹ آف آر انالیسز آف کنسمشن It will be good news for those who like the topic because this means you will be approaching a completion of your understanding of consumption. But it will also be good news for those who dislike consumption because then there will be no more of consumption. We'll move to production and other things, other more interesting stuff. But I hope that most of you fall in the former category. Now, before we start discussion on this final segment that is the indifference curves approach to analyzing consumption let's do a little recap on our understanding of the marginal utility approach now if you remember we introduced the marginal utility approach by understanding that there were certain questions about the demand side of the economy or of household decisions that could not be explained by the traditional understanding of demand so in came the utility revolution in the late uh, 19th century uh, when three european economists put forward the idea that things were valued according to their marginal utility and i gave the example of diamonds versus water that something as essential as water sells so cheaply but something which is really trivial for our daily life something like diamonds have such high value in the market and these were questions that could not be answered before the marginal utility approach was mainstreamed in economics we saw that things like water had a low price in the market because the marginal utility of water was very low and the marginal utility of water was low because you know why yes we consume a lot of water and therefore since the law of diminishing marginal utility states that as the consumption level of any quantity co commodity increases the marginal utility of consuming that commodity falls so because we consume a lot of water the marginal utility of water has fallen to the point where it is very low and therefore the price of water is also very low whereas for diamonds because there are so few diamonds in the world and because each one of us can consume so few diamonds the marginal utility remains high and therefore the market price of diamonds remains high but we also noted that this did not uh, mean that the total utility of diamonds was equal to the total utility of water no in fact we noted that the total utility of water which if you remember was the area under the marginal utility curve was far far greater than the total utility of diamonds now the marginal utility approach is quite useful there is no doubt about that but remember that i introduced the main problem with the approach in the previous lecture and that was that the approach uh, uses a cardinal measure of utility when i say cardinal measure of utility i mean that utility is measured in units some kind of absolute units so if you remember earlier we were talking about satisfaction units then later we moved to utils u t i l s which we introduced as imaginary or hypothetical units for utility and over over the years economists have found that they are not happy with this cardinal approach to the measurement of utility they would rather see utility measured in some other way because if you look at um, our behavior uh, in our daily life very few of us can actually measure how much utility we derive from consuming a particular good so for example if you go to the market and buy a toothpaste and buy a pepsi and buy an apple it's very difficult for you to specify exactly how much utility you derived from buying the toothpaste or consuming the toothpaste how much utility you derived from consuming the apple and so on
So there was no utility meter installed in the consumer's head which could measure utility exactly. And this is the reason that was given to introduce the indifference curves approach which uses the ordinal approach to measuring utility. Now what is the ordinal approach? Let's take a look at it. Now the ordinal approach to consumption consists in asking the question as to whether the consumer prefers one combination or one bundle of goods to another combination or bundle of goods. So you are no longer requiring the consumer to tell you how much utility exactly he derives from consuming a particular bundle and how much utility he derives from consuming another one. So you are not asking him to give you exact values of utility that he derives from these two bundles. What you are asking him to do is to tell you which bundle he prefers relative to the other. So let's say there is a consumer and he goes to the market to buy oranges and mangoes. And we'll be using these juicy examples today of oranges and mangoes throughout. So get familiar with these. So he goes and he buys one orange and one mango. And then somebody else asks him, Sir, consider this other bundle, two mangoes and two oranges. Would you prefer this to the one orange and one mango? And obviously the consumer will say, yes, yes, yes. The two oranges, two mangoes option will be ranked one. And the one orange, one mango option will be ranked two. Now let's make it a little bit more complicated. Let's say the consumer now has two oranges and two mangoes. And now you ask the consumer, sir, consider three oranges and one mango. Hmm. Now the consumer will think, well, I have, I have now four units in all that I am consuming, but now it's no longer two, two. I am giving off one and gaining the other. So now, although he will still not be required to tell you the exact level of utility that he derives from these two different bundles, it is more plausible that he will still be able to give you the answer whether he prefers the 2-2 two -two combination or the 3-1 combination. It is possible that he derives exactly the same utility from these combinations. In that case, they will both be ranked 1. And in the terms of uh, economics, you would call that he is indifferent between the two bundles. So if he derives equal utility from a 2-2 two -two bundle and a 1-3 bundle, then you will say that he is indifferent between these two choices. So this is what the ordinal approach consists in. Note that you are no longer asking the consumer to tell you how much utility exactly measured in some units he derives from a particular, consuming a particular good or a particular bundle of goods. All you are asking him is to tell you which bundle of goods he prefers to the other. So give you a ranking, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now, having introduced or given you a flavor of this concept of indifference, that is how a consumer can become indifferent or neutral between two options, two different combinations or bundles of goods, let me try and explain to you what an indifference curve is how it is drawn, in what space is it drawn, and what is the shape of the indifference curve. Let me start off by saying that an indifference curve is merely a line or a curve which charts out all the different points which are on which the consumer is indifferent. So you could have, let's say if the consumer uh, buys a 2-2 two -two bundle of oranges and mangoes, and then he buys a 3-1 bundle of oranges versus mangoes and if he is indifferent between those two then those two points will be plotted on the same indifference curve. Now the key thing to note is that indifference curves are drawn in goods space. So you have one good on the vertical axis and one good on the horizontal axis. Okay. So if you have oranges and mangoes you could have 
uh, oranges on the horizontal axis and mangoes on the vertical axis. That is the quantity of oranges consumed on the horizontal axis and the quantity of mangoes consumed on the vertical axis. And then joining these different points, so you'd have the 2, 2 point, you'd have the 3, 1 point, you could have the 1, 3 point. All these different points which give the consumer the same level of utility will be plotted, will be joined together and they will form what is called an indifference curve. Now, in order to talk about the shape of the indifference curve, let me give you a small example. Let's say the consumer ideally would want to consume a balance of oranges and mangoes. So if you like oranges and mangoes equally, you would like to consume, let's say, five oranges and five mangoes. Fine. Now here is this guy who comes along and says, Sir, would you consider giving me one mango and taking an additional orange from me so that you have four mangoes and six oranges. What would you say to him? You would think, you would say that you are disrupting my balanced consumption. That is, originally I was consuming five, five and I was happy with that. Now you are disrupting that balance. You are making it four, six. So I will not be as better off or I will not derive as much utility from these new 10 units that I am consuming that I did when I was consuming 5 plus 5. So 4 plus 6 is not enough. So then you say to him, sir, why don't you consider taking an extra orange from me, right? So why don't you consider a combination of 4 mangoes and 7 oranges? So it's not 4, 6, it's now 4, 7. So the total number of units that he is asking you to now consume is 11. So now you will think. You will say, fine, my balanced consumption has been disrupted. So I am not consuming 5-5 five, five anymore. But he is taking a mango but giving me two oranges. So maybe I am just as equally uh, well off as I was before. So maybe I will be indifferent between these two options. Then he gives you Another offer. He says, why don't you give me another mango and take another two oranges? So that means you will have how many? Yes, you'll have three mangoes and you will have nine oranges. Will you be happy with that? Possibly. But it is more likely that you will say that you are disrupting my desire of having a balanced consumption point between mangoes and oranges more and more. So it was 5-5, five, five, you made it 4-7, now you're trying to, trying to make it 3-9, and I'm not very happy with that. So you would have to give me more oranges to compensate for this loss of mangoes. So he might say, well, sir, I can give you four more. And then you might say, okay, I'm willing to consider three mangoes and 11 oranges. So maybe you will be indifferent between those three those three combinations. Let us see how, when you put these three combinations on a graph, what shape of indifference curve emerges. Let's use this oranges and mangoes example more formally. We'll set up a table, an indifference schedule, and then we'll draw the indifference curve and see what shape of indifference curve emerges out of what would be rational behavior on the consumer's part. Let's look at a slide to illustrate this. Now consider this table which summarizes the consumption opportunities offered to a friend of mine, Ahmed. Mm -hmm. So he's considering how much mangoes and how many oranges to consume. Now this table assumes that these combinations of mangoes and oranges all give Ahmed the same level of satisfaction. So if you start from somewhere in the middle, he is comfortable with consuming 14 mangoes and 10 oranges. Then if you take away 4 mangoes from him and give him 3 oranges, he will be equally happy with that. Then if you take away a further 2 mangoes and give him a further 2 oranges, he will be 
equally happy with that combination as well. Then, if you take away another two mangoes and give him five oranges, then he will be happy with this new combination as well. Note that as you take away more and more mangoes from him, you have to increase the number of oranges that you have to give him to compensate for the loss of mangoes. Now, a table such as this is known as an indifference set. It shows alternative combinations of two goods that yield the same level of satisfaction. From this now, we can plot what is called an indifference curve. We measure units of one good on the axis, on one axis, and units of the other good on the other axis. Thus, as shown in the figure, which is based on the table, mangoes and oranges appear on the two axes. Mangoes appear on the vertical axis and oranges appear on the horizontal axis. The curve shows that Ahmed is indifferent between consuming 30 mangoes and 6 oranges, that is point A, or 24 mangoes and 7 oranges, point B, and so on. And the whole curve is traced out by putting down the points A, B, C, D, E, F, G, which are all the combinations shown in the indifference set. Note crucially that we are not saying how much Ahmed likes mangoes and oranges, merely that he likes all the combinations along the indifference curve equally. That is, he is equally satisfied by all the points A, B, C, D, E, F, G. He does not prefer any one of them to any other. All the combinations thus yield the same unspecified utility and give rise to the indifference curve. Now let's talk a little bit about the shape of the indifference curve. As you can see, the indifference curve we have drawn is not a straight line. It is bowed in towards the origin. In other words, its slope becomes shallower and flatter as we move down the curve. Indifference curves are normally drawn this shape. So if we can understand why the slope becomes less and less steep as we move down the indifference curve, we can understand why the shape, this particular shape of indifference curve arises. So let's try to develop some intuition regarding what is the slope of the indifference curve. Now looking at the axes, you can see that on the vertical axis you have quantity of mangoes consumed and on the horizontal axis you have the quantity of oranges consumed. So the slope of the indifference curve at any point, so let's say between points A and B, is merely the change in the quantity of mangoes divided by the change in the quantity of oranges. So the slope at that point would be 6 over 1, 6 being the difference between 30 and 24 and 1 being the difference between 6 and 7. So the slope of the indifference curve between on or sort of on arc A and AB is minus 6. Now, the way we call this slope in economics is that we call it the marginal rate of substitution. Because frankly, that is what it is. You are substituting oranges in place of mangoes. So you give up 6 mangoes and replace that by adding 1 orange. So it's the rate of substitution between mangoes and oranges. So once we've established that the slope of the indifference curve is the marginal rate of substitution, we need to understand why this marginal rate of substitution falls as we go along or as we move down the indifference curve. Now the reason for a diminishing marginal rate of substitution is related to the principle of diminishing marginal utility. This is the concept that we introduced in the last lecture, if you remember. Now the principle is the same. As you consume more and more of a particular good, so as you increase your consumption of oranges relative to mangoes, and as you are giving up mangoes to consume more oranges, you will need more and more oranges to compensate you for the loss of mangoes because the marginal utility of mangoes is increasing 
and the marginal utility of oranges is decreasing. This is exactly what we learnt in the previous lecture. So fundamentally, if you look at points A and B, and when we move from point A to point B, we give up six mangoes and replace those six mangoes by adding one orange. However, on arc CD, we give up five mangoes and add two oranges. Whereas, as we go down further and we move from E to F, we give up two mangoes and add two oranges. Now, if you appreciate the fact that all these points on the indifference curve are equi-utility points, that they all give the same level of utility, then consider the move from A to B. As you move from A to B, you are losing six units of mangoes and adding one unit of orange. In order for the total utility to remain constant from A to B, it is necessary that the marginal utility of the six mangoes combined that you have lost should be equal to the marginal utility of the one orange that you have gained. Right? Similarly, along C and D, the marginal utility of the five mangoes that you have lost should be equal to the marginal utility of the two oranges that you have gained. So now formally writing this algebraically, we can say that in moving from A to B, we are equating one marginal utility of orange to six times the marginal utility of a mango. So now if you divide marginal utility of oranges by marginal utility of mango, you get six. Similarly, along C and D, we can divide marginal utility of oranges by marginal utility of mangoes and get the ratio of 4 to 2. Finally, on arc EF, the marginal utility ratios will give an answer of 1. However, if you look at the slope, the marginal rate of substitution along these curves at these three different points, that is between A, B, C, D and EF, you will get exactly the same answer. So from A to B, the slope is 6. From C to D, the slope is 2. And from E to F, the slope is 1, ignoring the minus sign, of course. Now that slide helped illustrate the relationship, the key relationship between the marginal rate of substitution and the marginal utilities of consuming mangoes and oranges. And the relationship is as follows. The marginal rate of substitution is equal to the slope of the indifference curve. That is dy by dx. But the ratio of the marginal utility of x over y is also equal to the slope of the indifference curve. Therefore, the marginal rate of substitution is equal to the ratio of the marginal utilities of x over y. So, dy over dx is equal to mux over muy is equal to the marginal rate of substitution. This is the key relationship that you should be very comfortable with in your understanding and analysis of indifference curves. So there we see how a diminishing marginal rate of substitution as we go, go down an indifference curve causes the indifference curve to be bowed in towards the origin because the marginal rate of substitution declines as you consume more and more of oranges versus mangoes. However, it is not essential that the indifference curve would be drawn the way we have just drawn it in all and every case. Right? It is possible for the indifference curve to be a straight line or to be L-shaped. Let's see through a sli slide how that could come about and what would be the real world analog in order to understand how such a situation could come about. Let's go to our slide. Now consider here figures 1 and 2. And consider here two possible cases. One in which X and Y are left shoes and right shoes. And the other in which X and Y are two brands of the same product. And the consumer cannot tell them apart. So you could think of Pepsi and Coke and assume that the consumer is not a slick stickler for brands, so he's not a, a Coke uh, fan or a Pepsi fan, he's 
he is neutral or indifferent between the two brands and we can take the two as perfect substitutes for each other. Look at the first example where X and Y are left shoes and right shoes. What kind of indifference curve would that give rise to? Now, the key point to note here is that the slope of the indifference curve, that is its bowed in nature, represents the imperfect substitutability between mangoes and oranges. That is in the context of the example that we just discussed. Because mangoes and oranges are not perfect substitutes for each other, the marginal rate of substitution declines as we move down the indifference curve. Right? Now, in the absolute case, when mangoes and oranges were perfectly not substitutable, that, would, that is, the, they were complements, then the bowed-in nature of the indifference curve would be extreme. Now, this is the situation that arrives, arises when you have X and Y as left shoes and right shoes. Now, left shoes and right shoes are not substitutable under any circumstances. You can never wear right shoes in your left foot or left shoes in your right foot. In other words, they are perfect complements. And so, they give rise to an indifference curve whose bowed in nature is extreme. And therefore, you get an L-shaped indifference curve. Now, let's look at the other extreme. That is, when we compare Coke and Pepsi. Coke on the vertical axis and Pepsi on the horizontal axis. Now, because Coke and Pepsi are perfect substitutes for each other, you would be indifferent whether somebody gives you one more bottle of Coke and takes one bottle of Pepsi from you or gives you two more bottles of Coke and takes two bottles of Pepsi from you. So you are indifferent between how many bottles of which brand are substituted for which other brand that you have. As long as the number is equal, you will be indifferent between the two. Therefore, the slope of the indifference curve in this case would be a straight line. So, the marginal rate of substitution would remain constant. It would not increase as you go up the indifference curve and it would not fall as you go down the indifference curve. Now, those were just two examples of what the shape, the exact shape of the indifference curve would be depending on the relationship between the good appearing on the vertical axis and the one appearing on the horizontal axis. If the goods are perfect substitutes, the slope would be constant and it would be a straight line indifference curve. However, if the goods are perfect complements, you would get L-shaped indifference curves. Now, note that throughout the discussion so far, we have just talked about one indifference curve. That is, one curve along which the consumer derives the same level of utility. However, in reality, there could be any number of indifference curves. And therefore, we need to talk about an indifference map. Now, what does an indifference map mean? Let me illustrate through the example I introduced earlier. So, imagine that you, you have that same trade-off of two oranges and two mangoes. And then somebody offers you one orange and three mangoes or three oranges and one mango and that you are you are uh, equally happy about those three options. So, plotting those three points together, you would get one indifference curve because they give you the same level of utility. But think of another option. Somebody says, you can have 20 oranges and 20 mangoes. And then says, you can have 10 oranges and 30 mangoes or 30 oranges and 10 mangoes. Now, there is no bar on why such a situation could not arise. I mean, in terms of human wants, you can want any quantity of goods, right? So, you could have 2-2, two, two, you could have 4-4, four, four, you could have 10-10, ten, ten, you could have 20-20. Twenty, twenty. So, depending on what your level of income is, but that we will address later, theoretically, you can have a set of indifference curves ranging from here to here and going upwards as well as downwards. And therefore, you have a parallel set of indifference curves, which is what we call in economics as an indifference map. Let's illustrate this through a small example. 
Now look at this indifference map. You have five indifference curves drawn here, all parallel to each other. You have one I1, I2, I3, I4, I5. Now all the points on let's say I5 give the same level of utility. And let's say the level of utility in this case is 780 utils, right? Then along I4, you can have all the points which give the level of utility 650 utils. Then along I3, you'll have a set of all combinations giving a level of utility of 500 utils. Similarly for I2 and I1. Now I've used these numbers of utils, sort of 780, 650, 500, just to illustrate that as we move up and up, that is as we increase the consumption of both Y and X, we are moving to a higher indifference curve, that is to a higher level of utility or satisfaction, which would be consistent with a higher level of utility measured in utils. And as we go down, so let's say if I3 is the middle indifference curve, as you go to I4, you increase your level of satisfaction. So every point on I4 yields a higher level of satisfaction than every point on I3. Similarly, every point on I3 delivers a higher level of satisfaction than every point on I2. In practice, all we need to do is draw these parallel indifference curves. We do not need to know exactly what level of utility in terms of utils they correspond to. Just by drawing these parallel indifference curves, we can understand how a consumer would make his consumption decision and this we will address after a little while. I want to take you to another slide though, another graph, which shows what possible indifference map you can have and what you cannot. Now in this particular slide you can see that you have two indifference curves I1 and I2 and that the two are intersecting at point A. Now consider the points D, E and C, B. Now you cannot pass a statement about I2 or I1 as we did in the earlier graph. That is, you cannot say that I2 yields a higher level of utility or a higher level of satisfaction relative to I1. Why is this? This is because comparing points D and E, the curve I1, that is the point E, has a higher level of utility compared to point D. Because at point E, you are consuming higher quantities of both Y and X compared to what you are consuming at point D. So therefore, I1 here is better than I2. However, if you consider points C and B, the roles are reversed. Now, I2 delivers the higher level of utility at point B compared to I1, where the quantity of consumption of both Y and X is lower. So this particular example of indifference curves is impossible to obtain in reality because you cannot rank order the indifference curves as one delivering a higher level of utility and the other delivering a lower level of utility at all points along the indifference curve. Now when we discuss this indifference map, some of you might be wondering what is the point of drawing all these indifference curves, like going on to infinity consuming 10,000 units of mangoes and 10,000 oranges, when in reality we can't do that because we are constrained by our budget or by our income. That's a very valid concern and this is exactly what we will zoom in now. Now in reality, each one of us has a budget that constrains our consumption. So we cannot exceed our consumption of all the goods and services around us beyond the budget that we are given. And the budget is in terms of money income. Now let's take an example. Let's say there are two goods. Good X has the price of rupees 20 per unit and good Y has the price of rupees 10 per unit. And let's say your total income or the money that you have in your hands is rupees 300. Now what can you do with that money? 
you can either spend it entirely on good x so you can buy 15 units of good x or you can spend it entirely on good y and in that case you can get 30 units of good y or you could spend the money on some mix or some combination of the two so you could spend uh, maybe money on 5 units of x right so that will consume 100 rupees of your income 5 times 20 and then you could consume the remaining uh, you could use the remaining 200 rupees for your consumption of good y so you could consume 20 units of good y similarly you could consume 10 units of good x that would consume rupees 200 of your total income and spend the remaining 100 rupees on 10 units of good y so you could have all sorts of combinations of x and y that you can use to consume your rupees 300 income let's illustrate how this gives rise to the concept of a budget line in the same space that is in the same space of the good y being on the vertical axis and the good x being on the horizontal axis let's refer to a slide in order to illustrate this concept of the budget line and once we have developed this concept we will be able to see and we will do this in our next lecture how the consumer combines his wants which are represented by the indifference curve with what his means are that is what he can actually buy which is what is represented by the budget line let's develop a better understanding of that through the, through the use of a graph now the table here simply lays down the figures that I have been talking about. So you have a budget of rupees 300 and you can either spend it on 0 units of good x and 30 units of good y or 5 units of x and 20 units of y or 10 units of x and 10 units of y or 15 units of x and 15 or 0 units of y. Let's call these points A, B, C, D, these combinations of points. So you have four points. Now if you draw these points in Y, X space, that is the quantity of good Y consumed on the vertical axis and the quantity of good X consumed on the horizontal axis, then you can see that the budget line, as we call it, will intersect the vertical axis at 30 because the maximum amount of goods Y that you can buy from your income is when you spend the entire income on the purchase of good Y. That is when you consume 30 units of good Y. On the other hand, on the horizontal axis, the maximum number of goods X or units of good X that you can consume is 15. So one thing is sure that the line joining the point 30 on the vertical axis and the point 15 on the horizontal axis will give you a definition of the feasible set of consumption for the consumer. So the consumer cannot purchase any quantity above this line, but he can consume all the quantities below or on this line. So the shaded area in the graph represents the infeasible consumption region, whereas the area, whereas the line, the area under the graph and the line itself represents the feasible region. More formally, we can develop the equation of the budget line. Now the equation of the budget line can be simply written as kx plus ly is equal to m, where m is the total amount of money available to spend on x and y, that is the rupees 300 budget that you have, and k and l are the prices of the two goods, that is rupees 20 per unit for good x and rupees 10 per unit for good y. Now, if we stick with the notation kx plus ly is equal to m and try to write an equation of this line in terms of y is equal to a plus b x, which is the familiar equation of a straight line, we can proceed as follows. We can take kx to the other side and we'll get ly is equal to minus kx plus m and then we can divide both sides by l to get y is equal to minus k over l times x plus m over l. Now m over l, if you recall from your earlier training in mathematics, is simply the 
intercept of the budget line. In this case, M is rupees 300 and L is, yes, rupees 10. And therefore, M over L is simply 30, which is exactly what we have in our graph. Now let's look at the slope, which is very, very important in this case. The slope of the budget line is given by minus K over L. That is a ratio of the price of X divided by the price of L. Note it's not the price of Y divided by the price of X, but the other way around. Now, that was briefly how we draw a budget line. But some of you might be wondering that when we drew an indifference map for indifference curves, that is human wants, which were represented by the indifference curve, why couldn't we draw a map of the uh, budget possibilities that any consumer could have? I mean, theoretically, we could have any level of income, not just rupees 300, could be rupees 500, rupees 3000, because different people have different incomes, different budgets. And yes, that's entirely possible. And that is what we will look at now. But note that unlike the indifference curve, where we did not exactly have an equation of that indifference curve, we have an equation for the budget line. So we know exactly the variables that can cause a change or a shift in the budget line. What are the two variables that appear or the three variables that appear in the budget line? There is, yes, the total budget, which is M. And there is the ratio of K over L, which is the price of X divided by the price of Y, which is called the relative price ratio of X to Y. Those two variables can cause changes in the budget line. A change in M can cause, uh, obviously, a shift in the budget line. If M increases, the budget line would move out. Similarly, if the relative price ratio changes, it will cause a change in the, yes, slope of the budget line, because that is exactly what it was in the equation. Let's develop this further through the use of a graph. Let's look at this graph which shows the effect of a rise in the consumer's budget from rupees 300 to rupees 400. Note that there is no change in the prices of X and Y which remain at rupees 20 and rupees 10 respectively. Now, what do we see from looking at the graph? We see that the intersection points both for the vertical axis and for the horizontal axis have increased. So we now consume 40 units when we consume only Y and we can now consume 20 units of X when we consume only X. So as a result of the increase in income, we can now purchase more. For example, if the consumer was originally purchasing 7 units of X, and 16 units of Y, which is point M, this could be increased with the new budget of rupees 400 to 10 units of X and 20 units of Y, which is point N, or any other combination of X and Y along the new higher budget line. Note that the budget line would shift out not only by an increase in the money budget that the consumer has, the shifts in the budget line are caused by shifts in the real income or purchasing power of the consumer. Now, purchasing power can go up because of two reasons. Either the money income increases and prices remain constant, or the money income remains constant and prices fall. If both the prices of goods X and Y fell, then that would have the same impact on the budget line as the case when the money budget increased from rupees 300 to rupees 400. So in this case, if the price of good X fell from rupees 20 per unit to rupees 15 per unit, the intersection point on the X axis would become 20. Similarly, if the price of good Y fell from rupees 10 per unit, to rupees 7.5, the intersection point would become 40. And you'll get 
exactly the same new upwardly shifted budget line that you get when only the money budget increased to rupees 400. So what this basically illustrates is that the increase in the budget, the money budget, has the same effect on the budget line as a proportionate or equiproportionate decrease in prices. The same holds for the reverse direction as well. So if your budget decreased, the budget line would shift inwards. Similarly, if prices increased and in a proportional manner, then the money, the budget line would also shift inwards. Note that in the discussion so far, we have assumed that when prices of the goods changed, they changed in the same proportion. So in the previous example, we assumed that the price of good X went down from 20 to 15, which is a 25% decrease. Similarly, the price of good Y went down from 10 to 7.5, which is also a 25% decrease. So the ratio of the two prices remained constant which is 1 is to 2, that is 7.5 divided by 15. The relative prices of the two goods are given by the slope of the budget line, if you remember. And anything which changes the relative price of the two goods, which was not the previous example, will cause a shift in the slope of the budget line. It will change the steepness of the budget line. This can be demonstrated with the same example. Here now we see that the slope of the budget line in the figure is 30 over 15, that is equal to 2. We are ignoring the negative sign. Similarly, the slope of the new higher budget line corresponding to the rupees 400 income is 40 over 20, which is also equal to 2. But in each case, this is simply the ratio of the price of X to the price of Y, as we said earlier that the slope of the budget line is simply the ratio of the two prices. If the price of either good changes, the slope of the budget line will change. Or if the prices of both goods change, but not in the same proportion, that is if the price of one fell but proportionately more than the price of the other, then the relative price ratio which determines the slope of the budget line will change. This is illustrated in the new figure, which like earlier assumes a budget of rupees 300 and initial price of X of rupees 20 and a price of Y of rupees 10. The initial budget line is shown by B1. Now let us assume that the price of X falls to rupees 10, but that the price of Y remains at its old level of rupees 10. The new budget line will join 30 on the y-axis with 30 on the x-axis. In other words, the line will pivot outwards on point A. If the price of y changed, the line would pivot on point B. Now the key thing to note here is that a change in the price or in a change in the price of one good causes both a shift in the budget line, that is it shifts outwards, in this case, and it causes the slope to change. That is, the, the, uh, the, the, line, the budget line becomes flatter as it does when we move from B1 to B2. We will go into the details of why exactly this happens, but to just give you a flavor for it, think of what is the impact of an increase or decrease in prices. If the price of one of the goods falls, it has an income effect, yes. So the consumer is able to consume more goods. So to that extent, there is an increase in his real income or purchasing power. And this explains why the budget line shifts outward. The change in the slope, on the other hand, refers to the substitution effect. That is, when one good becomes cheaper, consumers might shift from the more expensive good to the now cheaper good. So these are the two effects which combine to ensure that whenever the price of one good changes, the price line or the budget line shifts in a way so as to pivot on the point of intersection of the other good of which the price has not changed. So my dear friends, 
what have we learnt today? Because we have come to the end of our lecture. Let's do a little recap. Now, if you recall, we started with a comparison of the marginal utility approach to analyzing consumption by a rational consumer and the indifference curves approach to doing the same. And we noted that the key difference was the ordinal versus cardinal measurement of utility. In the marginal utility analysis or the marginal utility approach, we assigned units to the utility that a particular consumer derived from a consumption, uh, from his consumption of a particular bundle of goods. So we use satisfaction units or utils. But economists were not happy with this because in reality, you do not find utility being measured in utils or satisfaction units. It is very difficult for any one of us to point to a single item and say that this will give us this uh, number of satisfaction units and this will give us this unit, utils of, of utility. It's very difficult to do that. And therefore, economists preferred the approach of indifference curves which relies merely on the ordering of different baskets or different bundles of goods. So all you had to do was to ask the consumer how he ranked different combinations of goods. We gave the examples of oranges and mangoes and illustrated through that how the indifference curve or one indifference curve could capture all the points F or to which the consumer would give an equal or same ranking. And then we saw that the same indifference curve could be increased or extrapolated into an indifference set. So you could have a whole range of indifference curves capturing different levels of utility that the consumer would derive from consuming different combinations of goods X and Y. We also saw how the shape of the indifference curve dependent crucially on the relationship between the good appearing on the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. If the goods were perfect substitutes, the shape of the indifference curve would be, yes, a straight line. And if they were perfect complements, like the left shoe and the right shoe, it would be L-shaped. Then we went on to illustrate the concept of diminishing marginal rate of substitution. First, we showed that the marginal rate of substitution is equal to the slope of the indifference curve. But because we saw that the slope of the indifference curve went down as we moved along, this gave rise to the concept of the diminishing marginal rate of substitution. And we noted that this was nothing but an extension of the diminishing marginal utility concept that we had picked up in our previous lecture. Finally, we enriched our understanding of the indifference curve approach by adding the, uh, the dimension of what we could buy. So earlier we were discussing what we wanted to buy, which was illustrated by this indifference map, increasing or decreasing. But then we enriched it by looking at what we could actually buy. So it was the means that a particular consumer had to buy certain goods and services. We introduced the budget line, we showed what the intercept of the budget line was, what its slope was, what caused a change in the intercept of the budget line, what caused a shift in the budget line, which is a change in income or a proportionate change in prices. And we also saw what caused a change in the slope of the budget line, which was a change in the relative prices of the two goods. Now, this is broadly what we have discussed today. Now, in our next lecture, we will talk about how we can combine this understanding of the budget line, this price line, with the indifference curves understanding that we have developed to see how a consumer decides on the optimal bundle of goods and services that he wishes to consume. Then we will see how this choice of the optimal bundle is affected by a change in income and a change in prices. And lo and behold, we will illustrate those same two concepts that we talked about earlier, the income effect and the substitution effect of a price rise.
and we'll see how that can be demonstrated through the use of indifference curves. We will also have some additional spicy material for you, but we'll come to that when we do in our next lecture. Till then, it is Khuda Hafiz and Assalamu Alaikum.